Welcome. Uh, I'm Matthew Rothfuss with the Bethlehem Area Public Library. Uh, really excited tonight um, for our program, uh, How to Create a, an Edible Landscape. Uh, we're just really grateful uh, tonight for Richie Mitchell, who's joined us from uh, Bear Creek Organics um, to talk with us, as well as Carol Burns, who has um, you know, coordinated uh, with the Bethlehem Food Co-op to uh, put together a series of programs here with the library, virtual programs on Zoom, um, dealing with a variety of topics. So thank you, Carol, and thank you, Richie, for joining us tonight. Okay, thanks, Matt. We're really enjoying this collaboration um, with another community partner. For those of you not familiar with the Bethlehem Food Co-op, we're a group of neighbors who are uh, working to build, to bring a full service community owned, everyone welcome grocery store to a location at 250 East Broad Street in Bethlehem. So point of reference, it's near the corner of Broad and Linden across the street from Connell's funeral home. Right now it's an empty lot and uh, uh, we hope that in the next few weeks, we'll start seeing some activity there. The developers are building a four-story building and um, we will be leasing the ground floor. It will be built as a co-op for us specifically. And as I said, it will be a store that's open to everyone to shop at, but will be open, but will be owned by our members. So uh, as part of our mission, it's, um, we are very supportive of our local producers and our, our goal is to help connect the local producers with our local, um, our local consumers. And we're very focused on um, good environmental practices, sustainable, everything to bring good healthy food to our community. So that's where uh, Richie fits in and I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to Richie Mitchell from Bear Creek Organics. All right. Hey, how's everybody doing? I'm so glad to be here. It's an honor. And just wanna thank uh, the Bethlehem Food Co-op, Carol and Matthew, and all of you for just being here. It's really um, nice uh, that we're coming together as a community uh, around food. That's, that's what it's all about. And I guess I would like to start off by just uh, introducing myself and my company. Uh, I'm the owner of Bear Creek Organics. We're located in Whitehaven, Pennsylvania. So we're about an hour north of you guys. And we have an edible landscaping company. And I don't, if you guys are unfamiliar with that term, basically the concept of doing landscaping in your yard or your, um, community park or in your school yard um, and replacing the existing landscape or adding a new landscaping feature that is edible. So that can be fruit trees, berry bushes, it can be vegetable gardens, flowers, rain gardens. There's a lot of different uh, things you can do. So uh, Bear Creek Organics is an edible landscaping company. We do consult, design, build, and uh, manage of uh, edible landscapes, also known as foodscaping. And we do a lot of education around that. And we also have a farm that is quite new and uh, a tree nursery with fruit trees and berry bushes and native plants. So having said that, this talk is just a, a quick introduction into what's possible with edible landscaping. And it goes through the beginning, uh, how to begin to start thinking about your edible landscape. And I have a bunch of examples and depending on how fast we can get through that, then I'll I also have a um, second part where I can try to get into more of the technical details, but I think what's most important now is just to understand um, what's possible um, and not be afraid of um, deer and pests and failure because the results of your efforts are amazing. The, um, the, the investment of money and, your, and time literally grows in value and feeds your family with healthy organic food. So I think it's, a, it's an amazing concept to consider if you have space in your front or backyard, or if you know somebody that does to, um, even if you have a tiny area, there's lots of possibilities. So don't be intimidated by any of the larger examples because all of the stuff is scalable. And what's important is that you start taking control of your food sovereignty and start um, having access to um, ripe fruit and um, 
can, you know, uh, chemical free uh, food and know where your food comes from and be able to pick right from your backyard is um, an amazing step that you can take. So if you look at the top of the slide here, I just said your family, your land, your life. And that's, that's what it, it's a lot about. Um, you know, think about your family members, think about the land you live on, think about your ideal lifestyle and who, who you are as a person and how um, food can be supporting that. Oop. So it all starts off for me is the balance. Like we, we go into our backyard and we feel kind of out of balance. We look at our lives and we feel out of balance. Sometimes I'm not saying everybody does, but I do. And in this picture, you see there's trees being anchored or anchoring the balance beam. So through nature, I've, I've found life to be a lot more meaningful and understanding or understandable. And also through um, partnering with nature and partnering with, with others in the community. Here's an example of a conventional landscape. You can just imagine your own backyard and start asking yourself some questions. Um, do you have an ecological plan? Do you have a community plan uh, for your yard? Um, in this instance, or I always look at every time I walk down the street, I look at people's yards and I think, what, um, how can we incorporate natives here? How can we incorporate ways to support uh, bees and butterflies? What can we grow here? So this is just um, borage and uh, different types of bees. Are we considering our local ecology? Are we, are we paying attention to where the um, water from our property is going and the impact that's going to have on animals and the impact that's going to have on community members below as well? Think about um, rainwater system, uh, ditches, how, how full they get these days during a rain events because people are not managing water on their property. So community is really important. And, and as we develop our parks, as we develop our yards, we, we can keep community in mind. We can keep how that's impacting the neighborhood in mind, um, our families in mind. I see a lot of Japanese maples. I use this as an example because it's a beautiful tree. And then I also saw a, a red-leafed peach tree one day and I said, well, what's the difference? And that's the difference right there. It's the harvest. And a lot of people don't realize you can grow such beautiful fruit in your own backyard. This is a pawpaw tree. It's actually a native and, it, and um, the first time I heard of somebody actually harvesting pawpaws from the wild, they said they found them in Bethlehem. So I thought that was kind of interesting. The pawpaw is a native tropical fruit that grows in our area. It tastes like a mixture between bananas and mangoes, has the consistency of like a ripe banana. You can eat it with a spoon. It's just right out, um, right out of the, uh, you cut the fruit in half and you can eat it out with a spoon. It's, it's delicious. It's an, actual, it's an actual tropical fruit that is native to our area. Um, and, it, and it can handle shade. It doesn't have any pests. So this is just an example of an, how we can partner with nature. This is a native fruit tree that produces a fruit that has essential um, a, uh, amino acids. And it's, I think it may also be a perfect protein or something like it has a lot of um, benefits. So to start off, whether you're like, hey, I definitely want to grow food in my backyard, whether you're thinking um, I can never do this or whether you're just kind of interested, the very first thing you have to think about are what are your design considerations? And I, I took a picture of the spider and I also saw online the, the, what happens to spiders when you give them, uh, this was in a, I think in a study done a long time ago, they gave spiders different drugs to see how that impacted their webs. And it just got me thinking like, uh, how do we go about designing our land? How do, how do we go about, you know, thinking about community, thinking about the way we produce food and all these different cobwebs kind of just, it just stimulated my mind. It's like, and uh, showed me, I see this a lot in the landscape when people don't plan. And I see this a lot when I go to schools and I see missed opportunities and I go to parks and I see all this open space um, that can be planted with flowers or food. So <clears throat> are you considering the insects, are you considering the people that are going to use that land? What factors influence your decision? Fig trees, do you like um, apples? So here's a basic example. Do you like red or yellow apples? So um, also it's, it's a good idea to not rush into things. Um, if you love 
um, yellow apples and you go to the store and you just grab a uh, fruit tree from the local big box store, you might not know what variety it is. It might not even produce a fruit that a type of apple that you enjoy eating. So before you do anything, the most important thing is just to hold on and wait a minute and just take a step back and look at your life, look at the food you like to eat, look at how you like to interact with your yard, think about the things that make you happy, um, think about your family, think about your ideal lifestyle, and then try to um, incorporate a plan for how your backyard is going to support your ideal lifestyle. So um, what we do in uh, with, with our company is we spend a lot of time focusing on the front end of a project. That would be like the consulting, you know, questionnaires, getting, getting people to um, consider what their goals and values are, what they're trying to achieve, what kind of plants they like, what parts of the yard do they like. Um, so there's a lot that goes into landscaping and, and, um, and especially edible landscaping. So here was a, a little vegetable garden. This, this client, um, this might just look like a simple garden bed, but one of their main goals was they needed to be able to, uh, they wanted the beds to be higher so they didn't hurt their back and they needed a wide pathway so that they can get through with a wheelbarrow. And the funny part was when we, when we first measured it out, we thought, um, we thought everything was set and then we went to get the wheelbarrow through and the wheelbarrow didn't fit. So really um, basic things that you might not consider when you're in a rush, you think, oh my goodness, uh, spring is coming. Um, I just have to start landscaping. <clears throat> you might be missing, you don't wanna make a type one error. And that's, that's where I always encourage people to start. A type one error is essentially a decision that once you make it, it's, a, it's really expensive to correct, or you might not notice the effects of that wrong decision until 10 years later. You put a tree in the wrong spot, it finally starts producing apples and you realize it's, um, that's the only place where the kids can play soccer. Well, now you have to cut down your apple tree because your kids, um, you know, uh, playtime is more important than one apple tree. So you have to consider um, the impacts of your decisions. And a lot of times you can, um, you could actually save $20,000, $5,000 just by not doing something, not putting something in the wrong spot. Um, consider your, your ideal lifestyle. These are just some pictures of my friends and just thinking about some of the crazy stuff they do. And you have to consider how you, um, let me just bet. Well, if you, I'm not going to back up uh, in the slide here, but um, you have to consider how you live and how often you can attend to your garden. Um, a lot of these things need to be considered who's going, who is going to be interacting with the land. Don't just consider yourself, consider your pets, your family. You also have to consider where you are in the world. And the most basic thing to start with is your growing zone. So uh, if there's anything you take away from design is the scale of permits is you have to start planning your landscape with the priority of the things you have the least control over or the things that would take the most amount of energy and money to change. So where you are on the planet, that's one of the hardest things to change. I mean, you can't change the world, but you can move. So you want to, you first want to make sure you're in a place that you want to be. Um, and then you could start matching up what you can grow to your growing zone. You also want to consider the weather patterns and um, your seasons. And there's a lot of <clears throat> other things you could start considering as you go down the scale of permanence, as you keep working your way down to um, from the geography to the climate and geography, you start considering buildings. You start thinking about water. Water is way up on the list, way before you plant a plant way before you design a garden, you wanna consider water management. You have to have water management solved before you start anything. You have to consider the shade that buildings and large trees are going to produce. You have to consider um, these larger concepts that, that you have less control over. So you wanna make sure you're designing creatively with them in mind. A tree or a plant is the very last thing on the scale of permanence. So, um, Fencing is very low down on the list. You don't want to put a fence in as your first um, decision. You want to first consider access and circulation. How are you going to be navigating the landscape? So 
short and term, uh, I have here short and long term results. So how could we design the landscape, not just for the big picture, but for the short and medium um, picture? So there's certain things you can do to give you quick reward, like certain berry plants, certain vegetable plants, or um, there's medium, uh, like a dwarf fruit tree. Um, there's things that will give you reward in the medium time. And then in the long run is your bigger plan. So um, sweet spots, you're constantly looking for sweet spots in your yard. Where, where can you, you get an easy win? Where are there hidden challenges and where are there unforeseen consequences of your decisions? Um, this was an unforeseen consequence. I got a St. Bernard. She was really beautiful and, and tiny. And now she's really beautiful and huge. So you want to consider what rootstock your fruit trees are growing on. If you, if, are you planting a dwarf? Are you planting a semi-dwarf? a uh, semi-standard or a full-size tree. There's also hidden opportunities um, in the problem, in your challenge. So, oh my gosh, I can't plant this because of the deer. Oh, my yard is a mess because of this, that, and another thing. I'll never be able to grow my own food. The problem is the solution. Normally, in, in the face of a good design process, a problem actually gives you a better result in the end than if you didn't have the problem to start with. So it creates, it forces you to get more creative and think about more, um, more of your, what you're working with. So um, I just want to check the time here. So we are going to run through the time really quickly. So if you got anything out of this is, you know, I'm going to give you a bunch of fun examples, but at least the beginning part of how you should be um, visualizing and planning is uh, the most important part. So this is a, 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 a blank slate in Bear Creek, Pennsylvania, we started working with. And one of the biggest design challenges was we came into this land and the, they had a fence and the their water, their drainage issues were not solved. So basically our, we walked into this yard and, and the clients who we love um, and have a long-term rela relationship with, um, but they, they gave us a, a, a challenge. They said, hey, we have drainage problems and we want all this we want to grow all these fruit, fruit trees and berry, uh, berry bushes and all this kinds of stuff. But we had to kind of work in reverse order of the scale of permanence. So, it, or we had it, we had, the landscape was already developed in the reverse order. So we had to work with the scale of permanence, but it was a lot more challenging. We were working around the fence to dig um, drainage. We had to put in rain gardens and all kinds of things. It was a lot more challenging that the fence was there. It was a lot more challenging that the water um, and the buildings and things weren't considered as much at the beginning of the process. So we created a design. Um, we don't always have to make a design, but a lot of times we can design in person. And a lot of times you don't need a computer design, but in this case, sometimes it's very helpful to put things down on, in a computer program that shows you how big things will get when they're mature. So this is, um, this is the bird's eye view of that same yard we were looking at. You can see um, there's, a, we, there's a native bee and butterfly garden in, in the south end of the photo there. And if you work your way up to the left, um, you can see peach trees and a blueberry patch and different fruit trees. So the, the concept here was there was fruit trees spread apart, I think like 30 or 40 feet apart. And in between the fruit trees were different berry themes. So between some of the fruit trees are is a blueberry patch. And then there's a raspberry patch between some of the other fruit trees. I don't know if you could see my cursor moving. Sorry, I didn't realize I had this. So there's a raspberry patch here is between two apple trees. There's a nanking cherry patch. So a nanking cherry is a bush cherry in between an apple tree and a cherry tree. And there's an elderberry patch. So this, this yard was producing berries, um, medicine. Um, down below where the native bee and butterfly garden is, we actually made a really beautiful rain garden along with the native plants. I forgot I had the zoomed in photo of this. And then when we installed it, the first thing we did was we, we you don't have to, this isn't a requirement but because there was such a bad water issue. We raised everything up just a little bit to get the crown of the trees out of the water table until um, the water problem was solved. So a lot of, one, one, of a, one of the basic things you can consider if you're planting a fruit tree is you don't wanna plant them too deep, especially if there's water drainage issues. So it's okay to raise them up a little bit. What's not okay is to bury the tree way deeper than it already was in the pot that you bought it from.
There's the blueberry patch. And we use a lot of mulch. Mulch is your friend in, in landscaping, especially when you're um, growing food and trying to grow food, food organically. It cuts back on um, how much water you need and um, weeds from growing. And this client um, always sends us pictures of their harvest. I didn't have time to collect them all, but they're always making pies and jams and jellies and wine and medicinal syrups. And this was just a, a peach harvest from last year. There's the raspberry patch. Um, when we talk about easy wins and medium term wins, like the peach tree is like a medium term, term uh, reward you can get from your landscape. And because it's a fast growing fruit tree, and a, a bramble patch, a blackberry or a raspberry patch is kind of more on that faster, um, shorter term reward because you could plant a raspberry and get harvest with that very same year. And by the next year, you could have a patch that's grown in thick like this and you can get a bumper harvest. Um, and this is a really cool thing. A lot of people like fireplaces and patios. This, this client uh, had a lot of drainage problems. This is actually a rain garden. Just a creative little front yard garden patch that when it rains, it, it, it actually prevents the water from rushing, flooding the neighborhood um, drainage ditches. It, this property manages its own water as best uh, as it can so that it doesn't put the burden on the downstream um, water system. And now we start moving into just examples of uh, vegetable gardens. So a vegetable garden is another short, something you get a lot of short-term results from. And then what you have to consider with everything, especially vegetable gardens is the sunlight. So you might think that you, you found the best spot for your garden. But you also have to consider what you're going to grow and how much hours of sunlight it's going to take to grow that. There were some blueberry bushes in the corner and there's some grapes planted on the arbor here. So this is just an example of, this is a pretty big yard. I know in Bethlehem, there's not, um, a lot of yards are smaller. So you don't have to get intimidated by the size of this. Um, but this was actually um, the, the goal of the family. They wanted to host family and friends and do garden classes and, um, you know, picnics and stuff. So this, they were able to do that. We created this for that in the design in the center of this vegetable garden. Here's a smaller, um, Vegetable garden still has a lot of room to grow. Um, you can grow a lot of stuff in this. It's, I would say this is maybe on the medium size. It's not the smallest. Um, this is lumber that we actually milled for um, our own property. And here's an even smaller example where there's one garden bed in a person's front yard. And this is a keyhole design where it allows you to um, have better access to your harvest. And you can see I'm standing in the keyhole. So um, this is a very simple example of how you could start growing herbs and vegetables and even berries in your front yard pretty quickly and simply. And then the keyhole um, where I'm standing that you have to consider access and circulation. Can I reach the plants I'm trying to grow? You always want to consider the human element. How are you going to be interacting with the land? How are you going to be harvesting what you grow? And this is a bigger, um, more elaborate example of a garden bed. This is uh, where a um, entire side of their yard was converted into a vegetable garden. So this is kind of like the masked out example of a deer proof, groundhog proof, critter proof, um, eight foot tall fence. Uh, there's fence buried in the ground. There is electric fencing. Um, so nothing can climb up. So this is the extreme example of a garden, uh, backyard garden. And you can start moving into edible schoolyards. We do edible schoolyards it's just to kind of give some inspiration. This is the Graham Academy in Kingston, Pennsylvania. And we recently replaced all of the wood garden beds with cinder block because during the pandemic, the wood prices got so high, cinder blocks were cheaper and they don't rot. So it's a it's an idea just to consider your building material. The last couple of, some of the last examples were cedar and some were actually just white pine. So an untreated white pine or hemlock will rot quicker. Um, cedar will last eight to 12 years and cinder block 
you, um, will last a lot longer, or a concrete block actually. And you can see there's some fruit trees against the brick wall. So when we talk about edible landscaping, we don't just talk about, we're not just talking about one form of gardening, one form of food production. So that's how you can be thinking of your land is, um, this is a south facing brick wall. So there's different microclimates to consider in your land. Where are the areas that get a lot of sunlight? Where are the areas in my yard that might be protected from the western, the northwestern winds? So that's where most of your um, winter damage comes from is, is the western and the northwestern winds. Um, and here in front of us is a nectarine tree right here. And a persimmon tree. A persimmon tree is another native delicious fruit you can grow and there's berry bushes in between and Asian pears all the way to the left. That is Ben. He's awesome. He's my awesome sidekick. And that's my baby Luna. And he's just enjoying some shade under the grape trellis. And then there's a picture of the school garden when it's in full bloom. I think, uh, it's growing. You can see big fig trees on the right. So we grew fig trees on the south facing brick wall. So you wouldn't think fig trees are very easy to grow, but in the right microclimate, they are very easy to grow. If, you, if they have protection from wind, protection from especially um, winter protection, um, you can grow fig trees in our area. And then we're just coming into some pictures of harvest just to show some more inspiration of um, what you could be producing from your own backyard. It's, it's really amazing to, it's amazing to buy organic food, but it's, it's even better to harvest food right from your backyard when it's at peak right, ripeness and the new, uh, nutrition is the highest it will be. The taste will be the highest. These are heirloom tomatoes that the, uh, the, the students grew and harvested and they actually take them into the kitchen and learn how to cook with them. The, this is a Nanking cherry. So we're now we're coming into some pictures of just um, now that we've I've kind of zoomed through some vegetable pictures. Now we're coming into some fruit. And everybody, I love peaches. I don't know if I think a lot of people do. And we were, I think this was just right from our nursery. We we're just walking through the nursery and there was some ripe peaches on one of the trees and just decided to eat one one day. Uh, we were working with a client last summer that had a peach tree with a bumper harvest. They had hundreds of peaches. We just ate peaches for like weeks on end. It was amazing. Oh, yeah, this is the client right here. So um, the peach tree, I think, is way off in the distance. So this client came to us with some uh, with some mature trees that we we do pruning, and holistic orchard maintenance, which, uh, which involves spraying with certain organic um, applications to increase the health of the trees. So we're doing maintenance for this client, and we're also planting um, fruit trees in, as an orchard for this for them. So I think I'm more, I'm planting right now a plum tree. And here is a um, double landscape project we did with a local company in Allentown called uh, Peacefully Well Holistic Health. They uh, actually Winkle Speck on the right there. She um, owns the company and has a. Um, a uh, retreat center you can come stay with her and she will cook breakfast lunch and dinner all based all organic for you and um, a lot of that comes straight from her garden so we incorporated uh, apple trees pears um, raspberries strawberries lots of native flowers different herbs and um, she can now um, harvest and walk right to her kitchen and serve that to her guest, And then she also, uh, this is an example of some of her food. Her food, some of the best I've ever had in my life. It's nutritious, it's quite amazing. And then she does all kinds of fun stuff like garden parties and meditation and um, yoga classes. And the, the edible landscape supports all of that. You could see that on the, this is a swamp milkweed and the monarch butterfly is coming. And so it's actually helping the ecology of the area it's helping the community through people she serves. And then of course, um, shout out to you guys from the Bethlehem uh, Food Co-op and um, Kathy Fox who introduced me to you guys. And this is her front yard and it's in the dormant season. So it's kind of hard to tell, but she has some um, apple trees in the front yard. There's an apple. She has a bunch of hazelnuts, another apple tree over here. 
This was a peach tree on the other side of her house that we were pruning um, in February. And I just included a picture of an apple that she harvested last year from the front yard. This was a really neat idea. She didn't like the look of all that, um, all those meters. So we put, <clears throat> we put hazelnuts bushes in front of the meters to block them. And in the summertime, they're completely covered and she gets harvest of hazelnuts. And I, I didn't have time to put the picture of the hazelnuts in here, but this is what the side yard looks like in bloom. So, so this is a great example of an actual person in your neighborhood and what, the, what they were able to do in a small backyard. There's Nanking cherries, there is a peach tree, a plum tree, she has um, a, a raspberry patch. I, I believe, uh, I don't know if she has blueberries, but there's all kinds of fruit trees, pawpaws, apples. She has elderberry, gooseberry. And it's just a great example of how you can start eliminating your yard and start replacing it with vegetable gardens. And, and um, there's some actual, some milkweed in the back there. You could be supporting your um, local ecology. You could be supporting your family and also having less fun to maintain. Uh, this is just a, a brief shot of the nursery. This is our farm in Whitehaven. So we, we, per, we grow organic, um, organically managed fruit trees of all different sorts. There's, there's plums, peaches, pears, apples. We carry lots of different kinds of apple trees on lots of different rootstocks. So part of being able to edible landscape or, or, um, or create a foodscape, grow food in your backyard is to be able to have the right tree for your location. And the way I view the, um, the nursery is kind of like I, I, I give the example, it's kind of like a, a mechanic in their garage. So I have the nursery, the nursery is my toolkit. So when I go and evaluate a property, I look for all those things we talked about, the client's lifestyle, the, um, the buildings and structures, the sunlight, the drainage issues, the, um, the, the climate, but also the microclimate. What side of the building are we on? Is there a lot of sunlight? Is there a lot of shade? And then once you have all that information, then at the very end, you could start matching up your trees. Even within the species of trees, for instance, apple, there are varieties that do better in the heat. There are varieties that do better in the cold. There are varieties that can handle um, uh, pe pest pressure a lot better than others. So we carry a lot of disease resistant and easy to grow apples. And we also carry um, apples on dwarf fruit stock, semi-dwarf and full size, because you don't always want a full size apple tree. And you don't always want a dwarf apple tree because dwarf apple trees can blow over in the wind. They live a, a lot shorter lifespan. So uh, there's a lot of things to consider and it's really not that complicated, but it makes a big difference to take the time to plan and design these elements because edible landscapes are very practical and they're very achievable. But um, I, think, I think gardening gets people down sometimes because you, can, you make a lot of mistakes when you garden and that's a good thing and that's okay. I've killed way more plants than I've grown, but you learn from your mistakes. If you're investing into an edible landscape, it's really important that you don't start off by um, installing the wrong types of plants in the wrong places, you want to make sure you put the, the right plant in the right place and it's on the right rootstock and you, you consider um, your pathways, your, act, your access and circulation. You, you consider all these things that we've talked about throughout this presentation and then you're just working with nature. Then you're just growing your own food and you're kind of in the flow. So it's a lot easier to correct your mistakes when you've created a good design. This is just, uh, if all this is sounding intimidating and confusing, um, don't worry. There's a lot of easy examples. This is just, if you just want to get started and you don't really know where to start, this is a really simple idea. I love raspberries. This is a raspberry trellis with, I think there's three types of raspberries in this picture. There's red, yellow, and gold. So I think it was Caroline. Um, and is the yellow variety and double gold is the golden variety. There's the double gold right there, the Caroline. And you can just see, uh, 
the reward, the harvest outweighs any of the potential um, stress or the potential um, problem you might be considering, that the bugs might get them or that the rabbits might interrupt your, um, your plans or that your kids might not um, eat this stuff. There, there's so many different examples of success and different varieties and, and different, different flavor profiles within the different varieties and different harvest times. So there's a lot of ways you can plan this type of gardening around your life. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox, a lot of different plants to work with. And the, the results, the reward is just so delicious. There is nothing better than ripe um, raspberries right off, the, right off the cane. And there are the three different flavors. I like the I like the yellow the best. It's Anne. It's the sweetest. I think it's absolutely delicious. But they're all amazing. And then uh, strawberries are another very easy to grow, excellent example of an edible landscape plant. Strawberries are a ground cover, so you can actually grow strawberries underneath your fruit trees. And one thing we're not going to have time to talk about in this presentation, but as you plant your fruit trees, you can you can you can plant miniature ecosystems just with one fruit tree. It's called a fruit tree guild. And that's the concept of planting a fruit tree, but then planting other species, other types of plants around that tree to support the fruit tree and also just to get multiple harvests from um, <clears throat> from one area. And when I talk to my clients, that seems to be something that they never considered and that they like the best. And the strawberry is the perfect example of a plant that can pair with your fruit tree. You can have an apple tree growing tall up into the canopy, and you can have a strawberry growing low as the ground cover. So that's, those are the two, uh, that's just two extremes. They don't compete with each other. The strawberry doesn't take up any more room that the tree needs, and it just hangs out and covers the ground and actually helps the tree um, not have to deal with so many weeds. So um, you have an edible ground cover supporting the tree, and then now you don't just have an apple harvest, you have an apple harvest and a strawberry harvest. And then in between that, you could fill in the gaps. You can put the shrub layers, you can put berries around your fruit trees, you can put um, an herbaceous layer, that would be your native flowers. And you can start developing your edible landscape as an ecosystem, as, 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 a, as um, a system of plants that gives you multiple staggered harvests and that also work together and they don't compete with each other. Um, so you can be farming vertically instead of just on the space that you have. So if you don't have a lot, a lot of space, there are a lot of options to get a lot of harvest. And <clears throat> this is a landscape that was a, a bit devastated when we came to it and we started adding vegetable gardens planting fruit, uh, they had existing fruit trees. So we put a bunch of native flowers <clears throat> around and, excuse me. <clears throat> and they had a major water problem. And where we talk about the problem being the solution, we created a gorgeous pond that actually captures the runoff, uses that runoff to recharge itself. A lot of, a lot of ornamental ponds have to be constantly filled up with a hose. And I'm not saying that we never have to do that with this pond, but every time it rains, it, the, the whole pond system gets cleaned out and it also stops um, during a massive rain event, it stops the water from flooding into the house and flooding the basement. It stops the erosion on the property. So there's a lot of creative ways um, where you see all of those flowers up here. These are all native flowers. A lot of them are medicinal, echinacea, joe pie weed. Um, there's Rebecca. And that's actually a swale that also harvests water. And, and along that swale, we grow blueberries because blueberries love water. So we grow blueberries along that swale, flowers, strawberries, and the swale captures water and puts it into the pond system. And there's Jim, he's a, he's a comedian and he used to be a college professor and a priest at one point in his life. And a lot of this is, a, 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 we co-designed this with him. And he, a lot of this is his vision and he goes out there every single day and gets enjoyment from his land. And, and he's just so happy and so thrilled to be um, watching his pond and he takes photographs of everything. And his wife, Beth, 
is thrilled by the harvest and she's really into medicinal. So she's always out there collecting um, berries and flowers. And we actually replaced a bunch of their lawn with a meadow. So this is a, a native meadow. It's another way you can, if you're sick of mowing your lawn. And then here's some close-ups <clears throat> of the native flowers growing on the property. And then just another example, here's a community park. And this is just the initial quick design concept we came up with. They wanted to plant three trees. Um, and we said, well, why not plant three fruit trees? And then we, we are a lot bigger now. And these are the pictures I was able to find for this presentation. But each, fruit, each one of these fruit trees has native flowers around it. And it, um, it's just really cool. It's a really cool feature to put in a park. It's going to create shade and the kids will be able to harvest the fruit. And then one of the challenges that I saw here is just the, the, the support, the community buy-in. It's if you're going to do something like this in a community, you have to make sure that <clears throat> that the people involved are committed to it and that they understand it. And that's that's okay. A lot of people are not familiar with how to grow their own food. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's a great opportunity to teach people how to grow their own food. And it's also a risk because um, you really have to get that community buy-in before you um, do a community project. Here's an example, a tiny little backyard, very steep. Um, it was dangerous to work in. And I don't know if you could see, we actually had logs that we built little miniature terraces going up the hillside onto native flowers and berries that the, uh, the children who, the, the child who lived here and her friends pick um, raspberries and all kinds of stuff during their play dates. <clears throat> Hey, Richie, I don't, mean to, I don't mean to interject. Um, I just sure. noticed we have about a little over 10 minutes left. And I know you said you wanted to leave some time for a question and answer. So I figured I'd just give you a heads up. Okay, great. I will, I'll finish it up uh, quickly then. So here's, here's just a more example of a cool garden. At the Graham Academy, that was their second school location. Here's the other school location. And this is just where a lot of my inspiration for edible landscaping started was getting, having the opportunity to develop a school allowed me to learn all of the different um, microclimates because the school had so many different areas. Some had sun, some had shade and um, gave me the opportunity to really explore different varieties of plants and fruits. So just, I was hoping that these pictures are in firing to you as well. So any of this stuff, big or small, can be done in your backyard. <clears throat> so I guess I'll just uh, keep, I'll end with this. This is just, uh, I'll just leave this screen up because it's a nice picture of harvest. And just, I would like to encourage everyone that, that you could have any degree of all of these projects. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, having a plan, believing in yourself, believing in mother nature, and just you know, just having fun with growing food because food is amazing and nurtures us and our families and our communities. And uh, yeah, I'll, um, oh, I just wanted to say before we end, uh, if you want to learn more about me, I've been really slacking with social media, but locally there's a magazine. Um, it's the Natural Awakenings magazine. And we do a full page article in there every month. And it's always an educational, it's always an educational um, ad. So it's normally this month, last month was a vegetable gardening or this month was a, is a vegetable gardening. The month prior was about orcharding. But if you're looking for tips on edible landscaping, you can go through those um, months that we have, a, we have a, an educational article every single month that you can look for those. And our contact think? information. That's yep. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and we actually have those at the library too, if anybody wants to stop by. Um, as well as many books, hopefully that are helpful um, for this this edible landscaping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, unmute everybody. You, you're welcome to ask questions. You can also ask them in the chat, um, and I can myself or Carol can or uh, Richie can uh, can read them. I have a quick question. What is the okay. fruit on this picture? What is the fruit on the bottom? right-hand side 
I saw it in someone picking that, that type of fruit in one of your pictures during the- Oh yeah. Brown cherry. Yeah. Excellent question. Um, those are figs. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. So if, you, yeah. if you have a south facing side of your house, you could definitely grow figs in Bethlehem. No problem. If you get the right variety. Chicago Hardy is a really good one. There are a number of people that grow figs in Bethlehem. I do know that. So very good. Excellent. Um, Thanks for your question. You're welcome. Anybody else? Mm. Oh, here's a question from Denise. Is there anything that can be planted where a plum tree used to be? We had a wonderful plum tree. And, oh. It got black rot. We, we had to remove it. it. And it got black knot. We had to remove it. It was next to a pear and a cherry that were not affected. And she also wants to know if you go as far out as Albertus. Um, yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, so we travel. Um, pretty much anywhere in the Lehigh Valley. And um, really quickly, uh, if anyone's wondering how, how, to, um, how to work with us, the easiest thing to do is go to bearcreekorganics.com and just fill out the contact um, information at the bottom. And that emails me directly. It's the simplest way to get in touch. And from there, we'll schedule a consultation. And we, we service the whole, um, pretty much travel uh, at least an hour. So, uh, you're if you're within range um we're, we're very accommodating with travel because we understand not everybody is a double landscaper not everybody's interested in this kind of stuff so um we like to um we're definitely willing to travel to make sure that this work gets spread through our area so the answer your question black knot's a very common uh, disease for plums it's it's devastating it will kill them and it's very contagious uh, first thing I could say is if you have it, you want to cut it down, especially before um, springtime begins, because that's when the black knot will um, spread the disease. So you, even if, even if you have a plum tree, you don't want to kill it completely. You got to get those branches off that, um, uh, that you see on your, on your tree. So I saw Kathy had a plum tree and one tiny branch had a little side black knot. And we just cut that back as far as we we're able to, and you want to burn that or immediately get in into the trash. <clears throat> but if you have a whole tree that was killed by black knot, um, black knot doesn't really affect anything I've noticed other than plums. So, um, so I, I would say you could probably put anything in its place other than a plum that is susceptible to black knot. And there are there are some plum varieties that are supposed to be resistant to black knot, and we're experimenting with a few. And um, uh, I would have to know more about your, your site, but if you have, let's see, did you say you have some pears already growing there? A pear, pear and a cherry. And cherry. Tree? Um, I can take I, I myself think... off mute, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we did try for, oh, probably about five or six years to keep up with the black knot. And last spring, it was so wet here that the black knot just went everywhere. So we actually had to give up on it this year and we took it down. Um, but the cherry tree still being a stone fruit, I was surprised didn't get it. So we were just curious as to see if anything else would survive there or if we just need to just cut our losses and leave the, the pear and the cherry and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you wanna be really safe, grow something native, um, but yeah, I, I have to do more research on black knot. I don't, I don't know mm -hmm. everything I, about um, plum trees and all the diseases. I've only seen black knot on plums, and I've only, you know, I've only, um, uh, excuse me, stone fruit are typically harder to grow. So peaches and cherries can get other kinds of diseases that um, everything, everything requires a certain degree of spraying. Um, not, or let me say, not everything, but some of these harder to grow fruits Stone fruits, in particular, can really benefit from a holistic orchard management spray schedule. And it's not chemical; it's nothing toxic, but it's it's a it's a mixture of different um, beneficial oils and plant nutrients and beneficial microbes that you spray at key times of the year that um, help the tree cope with disease and help ward off disease and infection. So apples, 
So you could replace it with pretty much anything. It's just whatever fruit tree you replace it with may come along with its own weaknesses, its own problems. So apples are susceptible to fire blight. So you want to make sure you're planting an apple variety that is um, resistant to fire blight. So th those are some of the things I would consider. A, try, try something like a pawpaw tree, but you'll need two for pollination. Pawpaws don't really have any disease problems and they're native <coughs> and, and they're delicious. Um, you can go with an apple tree that that is, is a disease resistant variety. And it really depends on your context. What kind of food do you want? You could try nut trees or, or you might want to try a bush. You also want to consider the, the distance that the trees are, the, the pear and the cherry are, are from that spot. So whatever you plant there has to be, size that it will grow into has to be compatible with the space that you have. But I would say that's kind of a, it depends question. That's awesome. Thank you. I'll go up on your website and fill out the form. Thanks. Looking forward. I see somebody said they have a they have a, a fig a fig tree on the south facing area. That's awesome. Someone said they'll be reaching out. Great. Yeah. So the 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 best thing to do to get started with us is to schedule a consultation. And even if you don't want to schedule a consultation, you could e you could email us or you could go to the website, fill out the contact form, and we'll send you a questionnaire. That's kind of how we start the process. So the questionnaire allows us to understand your, your, your needs and your goals and your visions. And even if you just want to do it for fun, like if you just want to get, you just, even if you, you don't feel the need to work with us, that's absolutely fine. Um, the questionnaire is actually interesting where you can, it came from a, a designer, a, a book about um, designing edible forest gardens. So it's actually more of a brainstorm questionnaire. The questionnaire will help you better understand and better evaluate your own goals and your own needs uh, a little bit. But there's a lot of resources you, you could check out as well on the internet um, for edible landscaping. So if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, I think one of the books that got me started was um, Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist by Michael Judd. That just has a lot of nice, inspiring pictures. Um, edible Forest Gardens is like the is a very dense book on how to design um, edible landscapes in backyard edible forest gardens. A forest garden is something we didn't even talk about. It's, 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 you go really intense with the design process to, to, to grow a, a landscape that functions more like an ecosystem. So if you wanna go and learn a ton of information about all kinds of fruit trees and all kinds of plants and how to design them, that would be the edible forest gardening by David, uh, Dave Jackie and Eric Tonsmeyer. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there. And, and if and if you are, are curious to just get started with us, fill out that contact. Contact us from at the website and then we'll get you started with a with a consultation. Oh yeah, a, a lot of people just benefit from a consultation. So sometimes you just might need help getting a second eye on your site and avoiding some problems that you may not have seen and understanding some of the advantages that your land may have to offer. So I just I look forward to helping anybody that wants that wants to be involved and um, I'm also looking for opportunities to, to just, um, work with the community. So if anyone just wants to, has any ideas on how to bring more local food production to the area, to get students involved, to get, um, community involved with more local food production to uh, tighten up our, or uh, strengthen our local supply chain and to, to build a uh, community around homegrown food. I think that would be really interested. So one, one thing that I'm really interested in, and I tend not to have a lot of time for social media and for promotion and stuff like that. So if, if anyone just knows somebody that knows someone that may be interested in this kind of work, um, whether that's you have a friend, a family, a parent that might benefit from this type of, uh, this type of landscaping, send them my way. Or if you know somebody that might be a good partner or might be interested in a community project, I'm, I'm open to all um, basically it's expanding the network of, um, of this um, foodscaping, this edible landscaping movement. It's something that I'm really passionate about. And I think, I think it's, there's just so much space out there to grow food. And a lot of children, a lot of families don't know how to grow their own food. And I think that's one of the, <clears throat> that's one of the greatest things we can do just with all of the um, 
the commodity the raising prices and commodities and all the tension globally is we could just look inward at ourselves at our families at our friends our communities and strengthen from within and empower people through um, the education and the ability to, to produce uh, nutritious food and feed feed ourselves so um, I hope this was inspiring to everybody and if you have any questions feel free to you could email me at Bear Creek Organics uh, at gmail.com or it's 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 also just easier to go through the website. Thank you so much, Richie. That was great. This is great. So as a reminder, all the um, and Matt mentioned this, we have a recording of this and in fact all the other uh, sessions that we did earlier um, over the winter and they're all on the um, library's YouTube channel. So some rainy day, get a beverage and, and come back and revisit these uh, very informational and informative presentations. So thanks so oh, much, Richie. Uh, I, I wanted thanks, to Richie. something that something that just popped in um, really quickly. I do have a Facebook page, and either if you if you check out the Facebook page or you contact me through the website, I would love to know what articles. Probably do it through the Facebook page. What articles? Um, you would be interested in me writing for the Natural Awakenings magazine. So if there are certain topics that you are interested in, um, or if there's even a workshop that you guys would really like or benefit from, I'm, I'm in the midst of trying to plan workshops and trying to plan out the content calendar for um, which articles we're going to be producing for the Natural Awakenings magazine. So just feel free to go on the Facebook page and say, hey, I loved your talk or whatever, or I hated your talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh let me know um, how I could best serve you guys and how I can best serve the community uh, through this kind of work. And uh, if you have an idea how you, you if you want to be involved, also let me know. I'm also looking for, uh, I'm also looking to expand the landscape crew. So if you know somebody that may have experience in landscaping and is interested in food production at the same time, uh, send them my way. I'd really appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, yep. And I wanted to thank uh, the co-op as well and all you guys for this opportunity. It means a lot. All right.